Okay, uh, good morning. Welcome to day two. Uh, I, uh, I just have a, a, just an update on the slides. I was giving out some outdated information yesterday, so for speakers, uh, you are meant to email it and not upload to share it, even though you can. And the slides will appear, there's a drop-down link in the, uh, on, the, on the website, and it just says slides, so they're all there in one place, so sorry for the, uh, the wrong information. Uh, so our first talk this morning is um, someone who works for the uh, Linux Foundation on uh, the Git servers and other, other parts of the infrastructure, uh, Konstantin Ryapitsev, and uh, uh, he'll be talking on cubes and probably something interesting, I'm guessing, about uh, Copperhead OS. All right, thank you for coming. I know it is an amazing morning out there, and I really appreciate that you guys traded it off for me. It says a lot. I haven't had any coffee because they didn't bring any, because it's, um, I am running pure adrenaline, <laughs> which is good. You know, they always, yeah, maybe they'll bring it later, but they always ignore security people until the last moment. Observation. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, um, Cubes OS and Copperhead OS uh, today. Uh, we'll cover the following topics, you know, why did they do this to myself? If you were here earlier, you saw me try to make it work. Um, I had to switch to a different window manager just to make it work. Um, Cubes OS will cover, and Copperhead OS, I will go into it in some detail. Not too much, because um, you'll see. <laughs> I'll go uh, discuss the guiding principles for behind Cubes OS and Copperhead OS. I will go through device requirements, um, take a very brief look at how, what it takes to install it. What daily use is like, that's an aspect I'll cover most, because probably interested here, how, how, how it is like to actually do your work and live your life under Cubes OS and Copperhead. And um, what you will like, what will drive you mad, and, and convenience and security trade-offs. And we'll go for the future outlook, or lack thereof, for each of the options. Please interrupt at any time. Just yell a question at me. I'll repeat it to everybody to hear. So this will be a little faster, because I know uh, it's hard sometimes to remember what you were going to ask until the very moment. So please feel free to raise your hand and, and ask a question, and I will, I will answer it, because this way it's right in everybody's mind. Uh, about me, I'm a professional Russian hacker. Um, I was one before it was popular, so you've never probably heard of me. Um, uh, the lack of accent is the sign of professionalism. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Linux on the desktop user since 1998, maybe actually 1999 that I think about it. Um, I installed a Red Hat Linux 6.0 and experienced the joys of GNOME 1.0 and KDE 1.0. Um, ask me about Corel Linux, or actually don't, because it sucked. <clears throat> Member of the Linux Foundation team since, IT team since 2011. Uh, I've been running Cubes OS on my main workstation uh, since tw August 2016, uh, so it gives me a good two-year run on the Cubes OS. Um, it wasn't just an experiment. I can go into continue using it uh, as my daily workstation. I've been running Copperhead OS since September 2017, so about last year. I stopped running it in June 2018. You'll see why. And I hope to go back at some point, maybe. That's a, there's a caveat there. So there's a caveat. I'm a system administrator. I'm not a security researcher. I'm not a kernel developer. And everybody's like, what? <laughs> you, you, don't you run kernel.org? Yes, but you know, running kernel.org is very different than working on the Linux kernel. I usually say the difference is like kernel developers are like heart surgeons and system administrators are like plumbers. You know, down at some point, it's all about pipes and, and gravity and pumps, but you don't want your heart surgeons doing your plumbing as well, yeah, you don't want your plumbers doing your heart surgery. They're both important. I'm not trying to say that kernel developers are so much better than we are, because they're not. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm a bit paranoid, and there's some people asking, why do you do this to yourself? And like, I'm a little bit paranoid. I'm not nearly as paranoid as some people are. So this is, uh, yeah, this is an easy caveat. Say, um, my goal here is to share my experience using Linux-based tools that significantly improve my security and privacy. Because if you look, uh, if, you're, if you ever ask yourself a question, how can I significantly improve my security and privacy, the top answer is going to be run Cubes OS and install a, an Android device that is um, not tied to the Google mothership. So we'll start by looking at Cubes OS. And first, of course, why did I do this to myself? So I'm a system administrator, as I said. It is, it is important for me to um, 
the security of my workstation and the data that I have on my workstation gives access to a lot of secrets that some other entities might want to get their hands off on, uh, such as my encryption keys, such as my SSH keys, PGP keys, and so forth. I am the gatekeeper to some things like creating kernel.org accounts and so forth. It was very interested, it was very important for me to have uh, a workstation environment where I can be fairly certain that compromising it would take significant amount of effort. By the way, if you don't know, that is uh, Habitat 67, which is a building in uh, Montreal. It is, um, was built by, for Expo 67, and it was an attempt by the architecture to reimagine how it would be to have a high-density housing, but without the boxy look. <clears throat> it is very brutalist in nature. It is very hard to miss if you're in Montreal port, and it ultimately failed because nobody uh, ended up building um, high-density housing in that way. Maybe there's a metaphor there. <clears throat> so Cubes OS, guiding principles. It does compartmentalization via virtualization. What, is, what does that mean? It's that everything that's running on your workstation it runs in a, some sort of a VM. It is a type one hypervisor using Xen. Uh, it, it, the DOM0 is the privileged VM that runs on your, uh, on your workstation. It runs the actual graphical interface. And <clears throat> it, it draws decorators around every window, which indicates from which workspace it came from. Apparently, I'm running two workspaces that are invisible. There is a purple one that's called Chatter, which I use for all the web and IRC and Slack and so forth. And there is a work VM that I only use for basically SSHing around. And the work VM is covered. There is a title work in there, and there is a very bl distinct blue border. And the chatter VM has a purple border and a very distinct word chatter in there. It is theoretically impossible to uh, fake those using the, um, in the cubes environment. So as I mentioned, all applications run inside their workspaces, inside what they call app VMs. It also provides hardware isolation. I, all, all I.O. devices must be assigned to a VM before they are used. Um, there is a special USB VM that is, uh, it's called SysUSB, that is completely uh, isolated from uh, the rest of the system. It's, uh, the controller is assigned directly to it. Zen controls that controller. <coughs> and uh, if you wanted to use that device in, a, in any other VM, you have to specifically assign it to it. There are convenient management tools to do it. When you insert a USB device, for example, there will be a pop-up saying that a USB device is available. There is, I want to just show it right now because it's full screen. There is a little icon that says they can click and it will show you all the devices that are available. You can say, attach this device to the following VM and then you can use that device in that VM if you're lucky. Sometimes it doesn't work. So convenient management tools, that's what I, meant, that's what I mean by that. But I will also go into some of the details about what the other convenient tools are. It also provides network isolation. Uh, you have full control over how your VMs get online, or not at all, for Volt VMs or USB VMs. I can demonstrate it right here. I have Chatter VM goes out through over, via a Malvad uh, VPN client, and work connects directly. If I curl the IP address, you see that the, this is the Malvad IP address. If I call that one, that's the direct IP address that I got connecting here. So all applications that will be opened in the Chatter uh, app VM will be accessing the internet via uh, the OpenVPN connection. I can additionally use things like Tor if I wanted to. I can also have multiple VPN clients, one for work, one for um, untrusted connections. I have a random Malvad client that connects to a random endpoint, and sometimes I get a weird experience of watching Google results in very strange languages pop up on my screen because they try to guess what I speak by, lo by location. But um, that's a very good perk. So what are device requirements of running Cubes OS? It requires lots of RAM, obviously. You are running, um, most of the time on my workstation, I run about 10 app VMs. So each one of them uses from anywhere from one to four gigabytes of RAM. So on their website, you will see they say four plus gigabytes of RAM, that is a lie. You may be able to boot it and start one VM on a four gigabytes of RAM, but you will not be a happy camper because if you are anything like me, you will have at least five Firefox processes running. running. And if you know what a Firefox, oh my God, Chromium processes are like, you will understand that running any more than one requires more than eight 
preferably more than 16 gigabytes of RAM. On my workstation, I have 24. That seems to be a very good, comfortable number. It requires fast, large SSD disks because obviously if you're starting it from starting processes from different app VMs, you don't benefit from any of the caching that the processor gives you. Uh, they will be all um, red, cold from the disk. Uh, it also requires um, for all, all the other uh, DE decorations inside each of the uh, app VMs uh, sometimes. So you also require fast SSD disks, and NVMe is the best choice here. Uh, it requires multiple processors with many cores, but this uh, laptop is two processors, two cores on each, so this is um, actually fairly comfortable life if you're not doing anything super crazy. Uh, on my workstation, I have 4x8, uh, or 4x4, I don't remember which it is, and that's, um, that seems to be convenient and comfortable for my use. The CPU for a Cubes 4.0, the CPU must have both VTX and VTD. If you do not have VTD, sometimes processors will not have that enabled or available at all. You will not be able to run Cubes OS at all, Cubes OS version 4. Version 3.2 supported uh, processors without VTD, the or IOMU um, in AMD uh, parlance. But the, uh, <coughs> the 4.0 uh, does not support that at all. And it also, if you can, it, it doesn't require Intel graphics, but your life will be so much simpler if you have Intel graphics. You may have some other, something else, but your life will be so much more complicated, and believe me, your life is already going to be complicated, so you don't want to make it any more complicated by picking a different graphics um, card. So what's the installation like? <clears throat> It's a, um, so Cubes OS is built on top of Fedora. So if you've ever installed Fedora, you'll be comfortable installing Cubes OS. It's a modified Fedora installer. Um, Post-installation requires knowledge of what you're doing before you do it. Um, unless you, you're just messing around, you can probably accept most of the defaults, but you have to make decisions that will uh, affect how you're gonna uh, go about your day-to-day -day life. Is this just USB? Do you use that for your USB devices? Or do you go, there's an option also to use your SysNet. Well, this means also that if you use SysNet, uh, it's the, that's the VM that connects to the network, that any device that you plug in directly into your laptop will be immediately able to go out into the network. So that's something that you may not want to do. Um, which USB controller to assign it to? For laptops, that's easy. You can just assign all USB controllers mm -hmm. to the um, um, SysUSB. If you have a workstation, like a Dell workstation, if you do decide to assign your, uh, your USB controllers to the VM and you're using USB keyboard and mouse, guess what happens? You are no longer able to use your system at all and you have to reinstall. <laughs> that's what happened to me when I first installed CubesOS. Um, do you create regular app VMs? There gives you a, a default option of creating a work and a personal and vault and untrusted. And those are good, good, sane defaults. So if you want to do that, I, uh, I suggest you do. <clears throat> so what are the app, app VMs? So you have to think about them in terms of isolated logical workspaces. You, don't, you shouldn't think that you have to create an app VM and run each application inside a separate app VM. You can do it. It's, it's a complete total overkill. You have to really think them, of them in terms of separate physical workstations that you would normally be use, doing your work in. Um, the best metaphor to think about Cubes OS is you're running multiple uh, full uh, isolated hardware systems that you have a convenient mechanism of copy pasting and copying files between. So if you're doing all your work and you need to run a work browser and work term, uh, terminal and any other stuff that you need to do for work, you can run it inside a work VM. If you're doing something personal, you can run inside a personal VM. If you will go out and do something uh, questionable on the internet, um, you can run it in an untrusted VM that goes out through uh, Tor connection or a uh, fully randomized VPN endpoint. Um, you have to have an option also of using disposable VMs. So one of the cool things about Cubes is that everything is powered by template VMs. So in the template VM is the actual image that your VMs will be using. <clears throat> and um, when you bring up a disposable VM, it just gives you a throwaway uh, everything. So you start a completely blank um, just uh, installed system. You do all anything you need to do, like open a questionable file or access a questionable site if you wanted to look at the source and figure out what it's doing and so forth. You can then shut down the disposable VM. It will completely destroy everything that that, um, that, that activity has uh, left in terms of traces on that uh, VM system. So templates, you have to learn how they work. You have to think in, in, in the framework of system uh, of templates. 
Um, there is a slash RW and slash home and slash user local that are writable on, on your app VM. Every, every other location by default is not. It, well, it is writable, but it will be thrown away after you restart that app VM, <clears throat> which is a cool thing if you have a compromise that means re just rebooting will usually erase all of the uh, badness that a compromise has left. Don't rely on this, because obviously if they are smart enough, they will not be writing into those locations. Um, uh, there are community templates available, um, Fedora, Debian, and Honix. If you don't know what Honix is, that's a, uh, basically a way to do persistent Tor uh, connections, uh, Tor browsing on the internet. Um, and this is my screenshot of what I usually have on my workstation, not on this laptop. Um, I have a chatter, as I already mentioned. Uh, there's a personal one that's used for personal things and personal websites. Uh, it says firewall is basically a dedicated VM that just does uh, packet filtering. There is SysMalvad Canada that's a use for non-questionable connections for going out to the internet. SysMalvad Random is the random endpoint, as I mentioned. SysNet is the one where the network card is assigned to, and that's the only VM that is actually able to control the network uh, cards, your wireless or uh, your hardware wired card. There is an untrusted that uh, usually connected through the random endpoint. There's a Vault VM. A Vault VM does not have any network connections to it, which is a good VM for storing sensitive files or uh, something like your password database. Uh, and a work one, that's, that's usually I use for only SSHing. So what's the daily, daily use like for Cubes? For the most part, everything just works as expected. You have applications, they behave as they normally would. You can you click, you point, you start new ones, you, you shut them down. Um, everything is just like a, you would be expected on any other Linux system. Um, except, uh, obviously, copying files is more complicated. If you have when you copy files between two app VMs, you have to um, uh, either use a command line uh, that's called copy, um, QVM copy, that gives you a dialog saying to which VM would you like to copy it to. And this is actually, you get used to it very quickly. And also you can do it through a graphical interface and right click in the files manager. You can say send this to that VM. You can move it or copy or do anything. And they're placed in a, spe in a special uh, incoming directory on the target VM. Copy pasting on the other hand is, uh, um, will drive you crazy. And it is not because it is broken, it works as designed. And so cop, control C, control V, uh, any other operation will, obviously there is a cop, there is a clipboard client inside each of the VMs. So it will copy only into the clipboard in that VM. Um, you can then send it to the global VM, uh, to the global clipboard and, and, and send that clipboard to the other VM, but oh my god, this, you will always forget to do this. You've trained, I've spent 30 years control C, control V, and then learning that and relearning everything else is just the most complex thing I've done. And what you probably end up doing most of the time is just pasting completely random things that were somewhere from yesterday in your clipboard because you forgot to send the thing from that other VM into it. Anyway, it drives you crazy. It is, it's not broken. It's just how it's supposed to be. You, you, in a secure system, you don't want uh, uh, an untrusted VM to be able to override your uh, global clipboard. But it's just one of those things that um, is the worst possible ever when you do it wrong, because then you just, yeah, I've, I've discovered I know so many things from many different languages of cursing. Um, installing software via DNF and apt, it has to be done through a template VM. So you can do it in a running app VM. So if you start my work VM and I install, an app, an, a, a package that I have not uh, had before. I can install and use it at that point. If I shut down the work VM and I restart it again, boom, it goes back to what my template VM looked like. So if you want to use an application that, that um, you know, you'll use on a daily basis, you have to install it in a template VM, and then they will be available to all the app VMs using that template. And the same thing goes for conf global configuration files. Um, if you have to use something like a Kerberos client, and you need to set up Etsy, curb5.conf, then you have to do it in a template VM, or on each um, boot, you have to copy that file into the proper location on your app VM. There is a way of doing this via an RC file. Uh, what I usually do is I have a symlinks for those things, so I don't, you don't want to put the um, your Kerberos configuration and other sensitive files into a template, because then they will be available to all the VMs. So what you love about Cubes VM, Cubes OS, you do get the feeling that after you've jumped through so many hoops that you have protected, you've done your best protecting your data. 
Um, it is a very, to people who created CubesOS and who write CubesOS are extremely clever and are very bright and are awesome people who are, um, I know, have uh, security at their heart. They, they really are, they really thought about many things and some things I haven't even thought about. You will love being able to open ma ma mail attachments and disposable VMs. Um, if you've received something, say, hey, I'll take a look at this, and you are like, I don't know if I should be looking at this. You can create it, and you can open it in a disposable VM, knowing that if anything happens, at least it will be completely confined to that VM and destroyed once you have shut it down. You can sanitize PDFs, which is the really awesome part. If you receive anything from a vendor, you have no idea what's in there, but you really still want to be able to look at it. You can send it to a disposable VM. It will convert it to images um, and then create a new PDF that's just images. And, and all the badness will go away. Obviously, there's downsides that you can't copy paste from that anymore. But yeah, but if you've if you looked at the, at the PDF and you think it's safe, it preserves the original one that you can then go back to and open if you want to. Uh, upgrades are awesome for Fedora. If Fedora, a new Fedora comes out and you assign a different template to your work, and I say ah, I don't like it, so you can go back to the previous one with it, just click on a button saying to use this template VM instead of this template VM. You can also switch your temp your work VM entirely to Debian, like on a on a whim for a day if you wanted to, and then go back to Fedora if you really wanted to. I'm not sure why you would, because uh, Fedora is obviously superior. <coughs> <laughs> So Vault VMs you also enjoy because that's, that's uh, where you would store all your sensitive da data that you really don't want getting out and being exfiltrated out of your uh, workstation. And uh, I've already demonstrated you have different endpoints, uh, egress, egress endpoints for each app VM. That's the system that I really love and enjoy. I know that if I'm looking at this website, it will go out through this endpoint. If I'm looking at this website, it will just be the work endpoint. And I don't have to worry about how many traces I'm leaving out there on the internet. So it will drive you mad. Um, copy pasting, as I mentioned, will drive you completely bonkers, even though you know that this is the right thing to do. Uh, not being able to screen share will drive you crazy. If you've ever, if you're a manager and you're like, hey, let me just screen share with you quickly, well, forget that. You're not be able to do that ever. Uh, you can also not do it on Wayland, so we kind of share this pain with uh, all the other security tools. You can screen share if you run, as there's a way to run standalone VMs inside a complete window, windowed environment as you would normally do uh, if you're running a virtualized VM uh, for anything. You can screen share from that. It will only show you the screen that's inside that standalone VM. There's weird suspend resume bugs. If you are using a laptop, you already know that suspend resume is like magic that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Uh, well, you sprinkled so much more magic with Zen over it and, uh, and all the running v uh, VMs, so it's just, you will probably not bother most of the time. With this laptop, uh, it's, it's really uh, one out of ten times that I'm able to resume. Most of the time, something just doesn't quite come back right. Uh, <clears throat> there is obviously a launch lag uh, for app VMs when they're not running already. So if you wanted to start a new Firefox session from the personal VM, but personal VM is not running, then you have to basically uh, twiddle your thumbs for about 45 to 60 seconds waiting while the actual VM is started, when the Firefox is read cold from the disk, while well, that comes up and that ready to go for you. Once the VM is running, it kept, it's kept running, so obviously if you do it after that, it's gonna be fast, but, on, but there's this definite launch lag when that VM is not running when you're starting it. Especially there is a way, there is a dependency saying, if I, if I want to, if I open an untrusted VM and it's set to go out via Tor, uh, then it will start the Tor gateway, and they'll, they'll wait for that to connect, and it will start the app gateway and the app VM. So that's 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 a pain. There's rare but random weirdness that ever that shows up every now and again. Like I said, there is a lot of magic involved in uh, modern Linux workstation, and Zen just amplifies it, and Cubes just amplifies it to a hundred percent. Occasionally, app VMs just won't start. So you click on it, and it just just sits there. You have to shut it down, and you start it again, and it'll maybe work. Uh, microphone recently stopped working for me. Um, there is a, some also pulse audio magic where you can actually send microphone to different app VMs depending on what you're doing. That stopped working for me. I'm not sure why I haven't dug yet into it. There was a up pulse update, probably that's what broke it. Um, the resolver can stop working in one of the app VMs, some, so everything obviously stops working and you have to figure out what's going on. Uh, backups are complicated. You can, there's a built-in way to do backups, but there is no uh, automated hands-off backup mechanism. So you have to remember to do your backups manually. Um, uh, there, that's, that's, that's annoying. If you have a, your own backup scripts, you can run them inside each app VM. Then you obviously have to start and run each app VM for the backups. So what's the future outlook for Cubes OS? 
It is sponsored by Invisible Things Lab. Uh, it is under active development. Uh, Invisible Things Lab, I believe, is a Polish company. Um, they don't list their location in the, on their website, so I'm not sure if that's changed or not. Most of the developers are from Poland. It is partially user-supported via donations. You can donate. There is um, there's quite a few backers there, but obviously it does not pay all the bills. It's not a self-supporting, self-contained system. It is still uh, maintained by a business entity. He uses Zen, so if you've read the news and you know anything about Zen, Zen is never going to be in mainline. Zen was uh, promoted and used by uh, Amazon. Amazon recently stated that they are moving away from Zen, so I'm not sure what kind of future we'll have uh, for Zen and Cubes OS. Um, in the version four, Cubes OS has been rewritten to be able to have pluggable virtualization support, so I think they're thinking the same thing. They need to be able to um, move away from uh, Zen if, that, if the time comes. They continue to use Zen despite obviously there's been quite a few security um, vulnerabilities in the recent past. They, it's the system that provides the best um, hardware virtualization uh, as opposed to all the other ones. At least that's the claim that the state in their website. It has an active and diverse user base. So that's um, if something happens and, and the business entity behind, behind it goes away, there is a chance that the KubeZOS will continue functioning as, um, as purely community supported um, thing. So who is it for? It, I think it's, it's for system administrators, especially who are gate gatekeepers with access to privileged information. It has um, been promoted to be used by journalists. Um, I would caveat that if they have a knowledgeable support department, because they will be obviously needing to do this. Uh, being able to um, uh, securely open attachments without fear of them compromising your um, uh, workstation is a very important point for a lot of journalists who receive um, leak information from leakers and other sources, and oftentimes that information is just uh, spear phishing. Anyone expecting direct precision attacks by well-funded and savvy adversaries? Draw your own conclusions there. And anyone working in environments where they're likely to be in trouble if caught by dragnet surveillance. So if you're in a country, country where there's a lot of just dragnet, uh, you just collect everything about all your computer usage, being able to go out via different endpoint VPNs and uh, via Tor and so forth can give you an important um, way of remaining unseen by uh, such things. Who is it not for? Anyone not very familiar with Linux? It is not a workstation that you can give to a non-technical person and say, here, this will make you secure, because they will just not use it. Um, this is unfortunately not very usable for anybody who is not a uh, very savvy Linux person. Um, anyone who can't afford modern, powerful hardware, and that's an important point here. Um, CPUs capable of VTX and VTD are expensive. They are brand, uh, very new. Uh, lots of RAM is expensive still. Um, large uh, SSD and VME disks are expensive. It all comes with a high price tag. You have, you know, if you want to use it on your laptop, your laptop will probably cost upwards of $2,000. Uh, this is not something you can install and use on your old five-year-old system that, that is not used for anything else. This is a dedicated, um, I bought this specifically to use this sort of thing. Anyone who is in danger of physical duress th threats, obviously having cubes on your workstation is a very quick telltale sign that you are hiding something or something is really odd about you. So if you're in a situation where you are afraid somebody might come down, come and, 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 and say boot this up and shake you down, you may be, uh, this may not be the best solution for you. You're probably better off using something like Tails OS, which is a bootable from uh, USB, hides all your traces and yeah. So what can you use instead? There's, you can also use instead some of the things you can uh, reach some degree of feature parity with Cubes OS by using something like a fire jail sandboxing mechanism for your Firefox sessions. Uh, you can use Flatback or other sandboxing for, uh, for their op other applications. You can use Hunix for persistent anonymous surfing if you need to do this oftentimes. Um, you can use Tails OS for disposable web sessions. And, but I will note that Cubes OS offers all of the above but with convenient ways of doing, doing your work, like copying files, doing disposable things, at a click of a button when it works. It works 99% of the time. All right, any questions? Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about uh, copy-paste being quite painful. Um, you've got 30 degree muscle memory of using control D, control uh, C. Mm -hmm. uh, I just do highlight and center button-paste. Is there a way to be able to make that work? Because that muscle memory is very strong. 
Yeah, so the question is, would you, is there any other mechanism other than Control-C, Control-V to send to the clipboard? And it, you can use a mechanism like highlight and it will send in, in a middle button paste, but inside the same VM. You will have to still Control-Shift-C to get it to the global clipboard and Control-Shift-V to get into any other app VM. Yeah, those keystrokes are global to DOM zero, so they will still work. Yeah, even, even if your terminal doesn't support Control Shift C, once you get into the clipboard, into the X clipboard, Control Shift C will get that into the global, uh, into your global clipboard, and then Control Shift V will send it to the app VM. And once you're in that, once those, once that clipboard is in that, in that app VM, you can use whatever mechanism that you usually use to paste. Now, Control Shift C is caught by the graphical interface. It is not that, that keystroke does not make it into your app VM. Does that make sense? Right. I do have still a, a, about five minute thing about Copperhead OS. So, about cubes, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that a journalist using this would have to uh, have a, a strong IT support department. Uh, the thing I worry the most about uh, using cubes out of the box is something like the Fedora browser hitting an exploit kit or spear phishing hitting, um, dropping like VMware malware. Would you ever worry about your uh, your RW config being comp like uh, being caught by this or uh, or something like shimming the QVM start like anything QVM dash star command? I also I always worry about such things, but you know what what can I you know the level what can I do about this um, on a day to day basis is is limited, right? Um, we can talk about it later because it's a fairly in depth discussion there. It's not something I can talk from the podium. All right, let me move on to Q Copperhead, and then we'll go through discussion. So Copperhead OS, for those of you who don't know. It's a an, uh, hardened Android distribution, or was, or is a uh, hardened Android distribution. The, um, it, the reason I started using it, because actually uh, I've been using uh, Android for quite a bit, quite a, quite a long time. I have, um, I have an office in the, the village where I work, and there is a psychiatrist's office right next to it. And there was a pop-up on my very <coughs> friendly Google saying, hey, can you share your experience about using the psychiatrist services so that other people know what to expect? Well, I obviously never went to psychiatrist services, but now Google thinks I did. So I'm kind of worried about what kind of information I'm leaking that Google uh, is, will make available to anybody else. So my decision to go with Copperhead was partly driven by this. I got pissed off by that notification because my office is literally next door to them. Um, I decided to try the pure AOSP uh, if you looked at what's the best, what, what's the most secure Android, you know, all the hacker types will tell you that Copperhead OS was it, so I did it. But so much since hap happened since May. Um, Copperhead OS, in its previous incarnation, uh, imploded and died. And the, there was an internal political spat between the uh, two founding members of Copperhead OS. The company uh, has suffered greatly from it. The developer, before he left, um, destroyed the signing keys, so anything that any available devices out there in the world using Copperhead OS have been basically bricked. Uh, they, they are still workable, they're still usable, but they obviously cannot receive any notifications, any, any updates, anything like that. They have to be completely re-imaged in order to be able to, to receive security updates from that point on. Uh, yeah. So what are the guiding principles behind Copperhead? It is, um, there are a lot of this we're gonna be the same as with other pure AOSP like Lineage OS um, devices. So it's a Google free Android experience. It's, uh, uh, they provide fast uh, security patching turnaround. I believe the main developer of, um, of Copperhead OS gave a presentation last year, I believe at the uh, Linux Security Summit about the hardened Android stuff, or maybe not. Um, two years, all right. Um, they provide hardened kernel, obviously, with uh, KSPP patches. Um, they, I believe that he worked very closely with Case and with the KSPP project to, um, to provide those in as part of the uh, Copperhead OS kernel. It provides hardened compiler tool, tool chain and a stricter SC Linux policies that cool things like MAC address randomization. So 
um, on every boot, your uh, Mac, uh, your wireless Mac would be different, so that you know if somebody was trying to track you by your uh, Mac address, they will not be able to do so. As as we know, that malls like to do this when you enter the store, so they know if you're a return customer or not. Uh, there's stricter defaults, stricter defaults for a lot of things. Uh, all of the radios, except for the actual LTE, were disabled, uh, so you couldn't use Bluetooth out of the box, couldn't use wireless out of the box, none of that stuff. There's a lot more. If you're reading the website, they'll give you more detail about this. So I was very sad, obviously, when it went away. Yeah. I, I use GIFs too many times, so maybe I should be more like Alex. So I should like, this is a picture by Ilya Repin. Uh, uh, Ivan the Terrible kills his only son. It is, uh, yeah, it was the end of the uh, Rurik dynasty, and there was in, introduced 100 years of what's called the times of trouble. I shouldn't take, make that light jokes about that. So, uh, <clears throat> device requirements. It is only available on a very small set of devices. Um, it was in Google Nexus, not supported anymore because they dropped that. Uh, Google Pixel, that's what, what I got. I, had, I purchased the Google Pixel directly from them. There's a Google Pixel 2 is also uh, usable. And there's uh, development boards. If you just wanted to test it out how it works, they supported high key dev boards. Installation, it's downloadable and installable. It, you can download an image and install it but you will not receive over-the-air updates. So every time there is an update to Copperhead, you have to do it manually and reinstall it on your, on your uh, device. Obviously, you're, unless you're completely crazy, you're not going to do this. Uh, you can buy a Pixel from Copperhead OS. The markup is crazy. It's 80% markup. So you will, if, if, a, if a Pixel 2 goes for about $600, $650, you can expect to pay about $1,200 for it uh, if you buy it directly from, from Copperhead. You can send in your own device. You will still be paying uh, a lot of money to get it, you know, basically. You, you're paying not just for the OS, you're paying for the over-the-air updates until they stop, obviously. <laughs> so. so daily use, what's the daily use like for Copperhead OS? And, and uh, for the most part, it's just like any other pure AOSP uh, device, like Lineage OS. Some apps are available from F-Droid. F-Droid is a great application. Uh, uh, it's an app store. There's K9 Mail, which feels like you're using a mail client from 2001. Um, there are some messengers available. It's Telegram, um, Riot, Silence, uh, available from, uh, from F-Droid. Some other apps you can also install from the Play Store. There's multiple ways of doing it. There's Yelp, which is a, uh, a way to install, to get uh, APKs directly from the Play Store. I believe it via my violate various agreements with Google, so use at your own discretion. There's APK Mirror, which is also a way to uh, down, get the APKs direct, not directly, but from a mirror of the Play Store. There is Amazon App, Amazon App Store that you can install with limited success because Amazon, well, they're like F-Droid, but proprietary. There's very little, very few apps that are available that are any good. Uh, so many apps may not work right once you install them, obviously, because there is no Google Foundation Cloud, or GSF, Google um, whatever you call it. Uh, Micro-G did not work on Copperhead OS. That was a design, design decision by Copperhead. They didn't want to support it. Micro-G, if you don't know what that is, there's a way, there's a uh, um, clean room re-implementation of a lot of Google stuff without actually being from Google. But you still basically have to interact with their uh, proprietary services. So Copperhead is an excellent, is excellent for secure communication and browsing. It also has excellent remote at the station feature. Um, there is as, as a way to uh, verify that your Android device is actually running the proper image. So for example, if you're coming in in a conspirator um, meeting and everybody needs to confirm that their, um, their Android devices are still running the proper thing, you can, there's an auditor application that you can run and you can scan a QR code and it will tell, that, that uses the, a secret that is in the um, trusted execution environment on your Android that will uh, be challenged, there'll be a response. Unless there is the proper um, image installed, it will not be able to give you the proper uh, response for the challenge. So this is a pretty cool application. It is, now, it is still now available as a separate app. It is only uh, usable on Pixel 2 uh, on many, and some other devices, I believe, and not on Pixel 1. I've never used it because I only have a Pixel 1. So what would you love about pure AOSP? Mm -mm, the battery life is amazing on pure AOSP. Yeah, I've, never, yeah, I've never had to charge my device um, twice a day before I started, while well, I was using Copperhead OS, and the same as experience with Lineage OS. So Play services are extremely battery hungry. Um, I would, 
you know, have a fully charged device in the morning, I'll come back home, I still have 45% battery left, and this is despite using uh, the phone all the time. Well, there's also knowledge that you're obviously not being tracked as much, um, right? Because, I mean, the telcos are obviously still tracking you because you still have to communicate with the towers. The telcos, uh, uh, they know where you are, they know what you're doing, there's, uh, you know, still being tracked through uh, the web browsers, all that stuff, so there is caveat emptor there. So your mobile service provider still tracks you. Um, there's fast security patches that come to your pure ASP device. I mean, Lineage OS is great at this. Uh, Copperhead OS is also very great at it. They patch the uh, Bluetooth vulnerability within literally six hours of it becoming uh, available. Um, you, you, there's knowledge that you're using free software. So F-Droid supports reproducible builds. So that's cool stuff. Um, some features may be source available, not um, Fewer open source, so that's an important caveat there. Copperhead OS was a source is a source available system. There, it's not a free license. So, uh, what you'll hate uh, most of the apps that you're trying to use from APK Mirror or from Yelp will give you this all the time. Um, they still may work, so even despite giving you this stiff, but they, this, um, this pop up, but. Um, you will experience a huge loss of convenient perks. You know, mobile, mobile devices and mobile device is not just something we use for emailing and messaging, right? We use it to play games, we use it to play, uh, we use it to find parking spots, we use it to find was a good place to eat, you know, hail a, a ride and all other things. You know, you are pretty much going back to what mobile phones were in 2005 if you're using pure ISP device. Siloed apps may or may not work. They will probably not deliver notifications. Um, so notifications is something that is Google Messaging, uh, Cloud Messaging, GCM, that uses. Um, obviously, if you're running a pure ASP device, you will not get notifications. App, you know, app authors do not care about your weird setup. They will just blow you away. You can communicate securely, um, only with the same three people you know, who are using the same things as you are. So that's, uh, if, you are, if you have a spy circle, that's great for you. If you have real people who are using things like Slack or Facebook Messenger or something like that, then obviously you can't communicate with them without installing those things. Slack works, but notifications don't. Facebook Messenger works actually great, but then what's the point of using the device if you're gonna install Facebook Messenger on it? So owning a pure ASP device comes with all the social perks of being a gluten intolerant vegan with a peanut allergy. Some things you can't use, some things you won't use because, you know, you, that, that's against your ideological reasons for getting the device in the first place. Um, yeah, that was my experience. I've been a vegan for about a year and I've, the year with Copperhead OS felt very similar. Also, you can't play Pokemon Go. Um, that's, that, was, that was an important uh, part for me. I need three more friends to, for, to complete my field research, so please add me as a friend. <laughs> so future outlook for Copperhead. Um, they are not dead. So the, the Copperhead OS in the name continues. The main developer who was doing all the security work is uh, obviously out of the company, but uh, I'm not going to go into detail or take sides here. I'm just saying that Copperhead is not dead. They are releasing a new image that you can install and you can, they, their store is back. You can buy pixels uh, if you want to write Copperhead OS. Uh, who is it for? Anyone really worried about Dragnet private data collection by government or large corporations? By large corporations, I obviously mean Google. Um, government, I also mean, yeah. <coughs> Google. <clears throat> this is going to be true for most pure ASP. It's not just true for Copperhead OS. Anyone expecting direct precision attacks, we will find it in savvy adversaries. There's a lot of protections that Copperhead kernel uh, hardening and just general compiler stack hardening will give you. Um, there is a, a lot of patches to the PDF view and other things. So if you are expecting spear phishing uh, on a daily basis, that device is probably something that you would enjoy. Same goes for journalists, again, same goes for activists. Again, it's kind of funny that government employees and activists can use this to protect from each other. Uh, who is it not for? So anyone who needs to use the device for more than secure communication. Like I said, you, if you're getting a pure ASP device, you're going back 12 years to when uh, uh, the first iPhone, iPhone just came out. What am I using now? I'm back to stock Google Pi. Uh, I very re imaged my device, obviously, the moment when it was said that the, um, the company was in trouble because the last thing I wanted is have some sort of a um, situation where, uh, you know, employee with bad faith is going to do stuff. 
So I reimaged the same day for, to Google to install Google Pie. Uh, I have some privacy tweaks. I try to limit which apps I use. There is a Hermit app which is, makes light. You know, there's a lot of there, you can use a lot of applications through their mobile uh, mobile light applications, and the Hermit is an application that makes that easier. So check it out, Hermit app. Google for it, you will find it. I don't intend to switch to Lineage OS primarily because um, not getting notifications was impacting my work way too much. Um, I, the rest of our team uses Slack for good or for bad. There is um, things like IRC Cloud that I want to be able to receive notifications from. Not being able to do that is a big, big downside to doing this. I might go back to Copperhead OS, depending on how company fares. Um, we'll see. Does that make me a sheep? Maybe, for now. That's a Mareep, by the way. Uh, but at least I have an option to evolve to next level, which is Flaffy. Thank you.